come here, get off. Today we're talking to Tricia Seely, pronoun she and her. Tress is a family law attorney practicing in the Houston area. She graduated from Thurgood Marshall School of Law at TSU in 2011 and has been practicing law since 2012. She began her career with a small firm, then moved to a domestic violence nonprofit. Now she manages her own firm, ow, ow. <laughs> the Seely Law Group. She's passionate about helping people navigate the legal process as painlessly as possible during what can be a very difficult time. She prides herself on being compassionate and empowering her clients to make the best choice for their families. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. I'm happy to be here. Yay. Very happy to be here. Um, (laughs) So, Tresha, what did you want to be when you grow up? So I am not a girl who knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I think my mom probably knew I would be a lawyer as a little girl before I ever did. I think an arguing ass kid. Yeah, you know, (laughs) and I I was good with like making a point like (laughs) I need this and here's why. Let me give you the reason. I mean, I was doing that probably at seven. I love to read and, you know, make arguments. So I think my mom thought that. But I wanted to be I feel like starting from high school, I wanted to be a sports agent. And even when I went to undergrad, I majored in business and thought I was going to do that. And probably until I you know, kind of took a break after undergrad and went to law school. And then I realized very quickly in law school that that wasn't what I wanted to do. So, wow, I guess I didn't learn until later. Well, and that's going to be my next question. Like, how did you get from there to here? Um, so I, I took a break after undergrad and I actually was trying to, you know, get a job in my field. I was working in property management at the time, um, but I, I was trying to get a job, a, like a job that I thought went with a business marketing degree. Right. Um, mm-hmm. I was trying to like get into pharmaceutical sales and some other things that I feel like I knew would be lucrative. Um And it kind of didn't work out that way. So I continued to kind of work in property management and work my way up that way. And so then I had the bright idea, you know what, I will go back to law school um, and I'll just continue to work like as our legal counsel for the property management company I work for. I'll just kind of move to legal. And so I went to law school and that was always my intention. Um, And then I think my first summer I interned uh, for the attorney general's office. So handling like child support. I hated it, but I feel like I knew that I wanted to do family law. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this next summer I ended up interning in another family law internship. And that's just what I've been doing ever since. Wow. (laughs) Really, (laughs) I'm sorry. My phone was um, anyway. (laughs) <laughs> so what's your favorite thing about what you do? <laughs> um, so the happy stuff and really the only happy thing I get to do is adoption. So I'd say that's mm. my favorite part because adoption day is always a good day. You know, we get through this long, lengthy process of all the paperwork and all the hoops we have to jump through. And at the end of it, you know, the child gets to go with their forever family. So I would say that that's probably the only happy thing I get to do. So that's my favorite. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, everything Although, else is like just helping people make it through. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, from my experience, that yeah. day when it was over was a damn happy day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I have had lots of tears on divorce day and lots of people very happy or, you know, sometimes people are very sad. Um, So it kind of just depends on the person and how they handle it. But yeah, for a lot of people, that's a good day. Okay. I remember people would always say, oh, like when they found out, which was way after the fact, because I used to not put my business all over the place. <laughs> Um, and folks would be like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'd be like, girl, don't be sorry. Say congratulations. Right. But that was me. (laughs) Well, and so, and I, I say that to be, I said that to one guy. I was like, you know, he was like, I just finished going through a divorce. I was like, congratulations, boo. And he was like, she left me. I was like, Uh, Oh. You're like, oh yeah, we have different experiences. <laughs> I'm like, oh, let me find her and tell her congratulations. <laughs> yeah, and you know, y'all would be surprised. Sometimes I literally am at divorce day and I've had my client and her husband standing there together holding hands and we're divorcing them. Wow. Okay. And so like they're there and clearly they're hugging and the judge is like, are you guys sure this is what you want to do? But they're both <laughs> crying and hugging and holding hands. So it's just a, 
a difficult thing to process sometimes and everybody processes it differently. Yeah. Wow. All right. Oh, okay. So I'm wondering how your work impacts your personal life, if at all. I think it does. I mean, I have to make a conscious decision to not be jaded when it comes to relationships Mm -hmm. Um, because seeing them kind of break down every day definitely starts to kind of um, affect your psyche and you start to think that, okay, this is how every relationship is going to end. So I really, at the end of the day, have to have a talk with myself like, okay, this is not everybody's relationship. A lot of people, I will say, once they've gotten to me, Uh, you know, not everybody, but a lot of times there just has not been a lot of work done before they got married with Mm -hmm. making sure that this person was their forever partner. Right. So not asking, I mean, some people come to me, they don't even know whether what their partner social is, right? Like what Mm -hmm. we all talking about is Mm -hmm. my question. Like you don't know where he works. You don't know, you know what he's doing. And so sometimes that happens. And when that does happen, you're like, okay, you guys didn't do a lot of the work that you had to do ahead of time. And so I try to remember that, right? Sometimes these things don't work because maybe that was the case. Or sometimes people just, you know, people, things don't work out and that's okay. You know, we may get clients that have been married for 40 years and at the end of the day, it just doesn't work anymore. And that's okay. Um, once you come to the realization that that's the case, we just kind of have to get you out of it gently and as um, seamlessly as possible. But it definitely starts to make you have a distrust in mm-hmm. long term relationships. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you see them at their worst point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you do. And it's hard. I mean, especially when I worked at the domestic violence agency. I think I worked there for four years and that is really tough because those are all not just, okay, we're just deciding to go our separate ways. You know, these people are coming and they've been abused most of the time physically. Sometimes it wouldn't be physical, but most of the time it was physically. Um, and you know, it may be a minor, we had one physical dispute or it may be, you know, he broke my neck. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes it's even more difficult because those people aren't ready to leave. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've got plenty of women that came to me and they're like, oh, I'm going to stay with them. Um, mm-hmm. And so that becomes a very different conversation about, OK, well. And sometimes it's a tough one, like, OK, well, he's going to kill you. Mm. So that's probably not the best idea. But ultimately, you have to make your own decisions. And this is what you can do to try to keep yourself safe. This is what you can try to do to keep your kids safe. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's very hard to view people in relationships at that point. Yeah. I mean, as someone who has dealt with intimate partner violence, like, Mm -hmm. like, I know that tough part of that. Like, when do you leave? And unfortunately, it's not always easy to do that. I didn't leave the first time. Right. It's not. And a lot of times we, you know, we would our focus would be safety planning. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's figure out a safety plan for you, because let's figure out how we can get you out safely when you are ready. And a lot of times, you know, the decision is is not just about them. So they don't want their kids to be affected or they're scared. He's going to, you know, harm everybody when they try to leave, because that Mm -hmm. is one of the most dangerous times, of course, when a woman is trying to leave that situation. So I completely understand it. However, in some situations, you know, you really do know the next time he's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I, I make that very clear to them because ultimately your life is at stake because Um, sometimes people in that situation tend to minimize it, right? I think it's kind of a defense mechanism, right? Like you don't want your family and friends to worry about you. You don't Mm -hmm. want them to be so concerned and um, think that it's going to be something that's going to seriously harm you. So they kind of minimize it. And it's kind of like, oh, no, it's okay. Like, I I know that last time, you know, he literally broke a vertebrae in my neck, but, you know, it's okay. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Um, And so sometimes you have to have those tough conversations. Yeah. So um, on the flip side, do people act funny when they find out that you are a divorce attorney? <laughs> um, like people I'm dating or just people I meet in life? Both. Both. Um, so, yeah, people I'm, I feel like with men, the assumption is automatically that you represent women. Right. And so when they hear you're a divorce attorney, the assumption is that you help women get child support or mm. you help women. And I, I, I have plenty of male clients. So and there's no the problem case. with helping women. Right. Right. <laughs> right. On the, think, their child's life. Like, right. I think they automatically take offense to that though. Like any, 
female attorney that handles family law cases, you automatically are trying to stick it to the man. And that really isn't the case at all. I mean, ultimately, whether I represent the man or the woman, my goal is to try to help you, of course, get what you're entitled to and to to dissolve the marriage. So some I do get little comments like that from men. Um, people just out in the world, I don't think they act funny, but anytime somebody hears you're any kind of lawyer, you know, you start getting all the questions, like, yeah. like we're doing a consultation on the spot at the bar. Okay. We're not going to do this guys. Um, <laughs> but people always want to, you know, ask all the questions once they find out you're an attorney and about anything. And I like to tell people like, okay, so I don't know about criminal law. And it's like, well, you're a lawyer. Don't you know? And I'm like, okay, so do you go ask your pediatrician to do like your heart surgery? I wouldn't. So every lawyer doesn't practice every kind of law, but people have a hard time with that. Because niggas like free shit. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know what? It's funny when we first talked to our attorney, um, you know, we were very, She. it was very clear. I think one of the reasons that we were, that I liked her mm-hmm. was because she was referred to us by someone mm-hmm who ended up not being a fit. Mm-hmm. And the reason I liked her was that she was like, nah, this isn't, I, I, can't, what I, I do. can't do this. So right. let me refer you to someone. <laughs> and so she was like, she was like, yeah, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad y'all understand that. And no, I don't do divorces. <laughs> we were like, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Already done. I've been, <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> yeah. And you know, so there are some attorneys that take on every kind of case and no shade to them, but I like to know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so I was a lot of shade. <laughs> I'm just not going to, you know, and sometimes people do study several areas, but there's just a lot to learn Mm -hmm. and a lot to know and be experienced in. So I don't like to kind of figure it out while I'm handling someone's case. That's just kind of not how I operate. So I know family law. I've been doing it for a very long time. So I can confidently advise somebody on what what would be the best course of action. That's real. Don't be figuring it out on me. Right. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Same case with the doctor. Like, I know you, I know you see hearts and you probably did this event. School, but let's not try it on me. You know? Yeah, like I don't want to be your guinea pig. Exactly, no, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so we we already touched on that. Um, both Kenria and I have been there, done that with divorce. Um, mm-hmm. What percentage of your clients are black? And like, do you tend do they tend to be women, or you know, do other folks more, do like men want more uh, want a woman representing them more? Mm-hmm. Kind of give us a little idea of your breakdown. Sure. So right now, yes, most of my clients are black. I I would probably say it's probably 75 percent black, 25 percent Hispanic currently. Mm -hmm. Um, And I will say that. And you're in Texas, right? Yes. I'm here in Houston. So I'm licensed in Texas. Um, Mm -hmm. I would say that probably half and half, though, on men and women right now. Mm -hmm. Um, So and so, you know, people reach out, men or women, whether it be a divorce, whether it be a custody dispute. Um, I think there's less of a um, stigma that, you know, a woman automatically gets custody. Right. So I do find that more men call and want to actually try to get custody of their kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, right now, my male female breakdown is probably 50 50. Hmm. OK. That custody piece is interesting to me. Um, So I was raised primarily by my dad. When my Mm -hmm. parents got divorced, my dad got custody. Mm -hmm. And I was always like the weird one. Like, what you mean, your daddy? And I'm like, yeah, my dad was the one. He initiated divorce. He fought for custody. He's the responsible party. (laughs) (laughs) But it was very rare back then. Yeah. And honestly, I think men still think that because a lot of times I get calls from men and they'll say, I mean, I know I probably could never get custody. So we all are kind of, uh, conditioned at this point to think that because when we were younger, it really wasn't very common. But mm-hmm. I do think we see more and more now that it's just best interest of the child. So mm-hmm. if dad is all around the more stable parent or the better parent, then the courts will award custody to dad. It doesn't automatically go to mom these days. Yeah. All right. Have you seen an uptick or I guess even a downward trend in business during COVID? No, I didn't. I haven't seen a downward trend at all. Um, <laughs> I the be, I will say that in the beginning of COVID, so maybe March, April, I was getting a lot of people calling saying they wanted to pursue a divorce or custody or whatever it was, but they weren't necessarily ready to hire. Mm-hmm. But probably once we got in May, June, like end of the summer, oh, people are hitting <laughs> the ground running like, yeah, I'm ready. 
I want to file today. What can we do? <laughs> We've been in this house all uh-huh. this time. Yeah, I think it's that. I think it's being locked in together. I think people really have to evaluate, okay, like, do I even like this person? And then also we've kind of had, in, in my experience, I've had an increase in people calling about like custody disputes because mm. it's been COVID. So mom may say I'm not sending the kid because of COVID. And that's just really not a thing. Like our Supreme Court in Texas has issued several orders saying COVID does not stop your custody order. Right. So you need to send your child. But a lot of people were just refusing. Yeah, Um, that was me for a little mm -hmm, bit. mm -hmm, It happened. (laughs) And, you know, when people would call me about it, like, ultimately, I'm not going to advise anyone not to follow a court order. But, you know, what I tell my clients is you have to do what you have to do. But these are your possible consequences. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you are empowered to make whatever decision you make. And you understand what the consequences are. And then you do what you have to do. Yeah. I had to communicate expectations very, very clearly before (laughs) I was willing to let my child out of my house. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had the same. I had to have the, okay, so this is what the CDC is saying conversation. Right. Right. Because just when raising kids in general, you know, you may believe in one thing and they believe in child rearing in a completely different way. You might have had a baby by a hotel. (laughs) You loud. (laughs) So when that happens, you know, when these kind of issues come up, like a pandemic, you don't know if the other person's going to take it seriously. You know, you know, you don't mm-hmm. know if he wants your kid to take medicine or to if he believes that your kid should wear a mask because he thinks it's fake. You know, you know how hotels get down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know how hotels get down. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> So it's interesting that you like brought up that because Mm -hmm. I do think you get to see relationships really intimately and from an uncommon, uncommon vantage point, like when it's falling apart. So are there any like recurring red flags that you've noticed over the years? Like when they telling the story, you like, girl, (laughs) that goes on a bingo card. So I will say that with the, like I said, working at a domestic violence agency that, agency, that was a little different. So mm. I would say that I don't know if it was a recurring red flag. However, there was only one person I talked to in the whole four years I was there that he hit her for the first time after they got married. Like, right, we got married. And then the next day is the first day he put his hands on me. Mm. That normally is happening before we actually marry them. So, I mean, that is uh, obviously a humongous more than a red flag, right? Like a bomb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just not something that somebody's normally going to work through on their own, right? So that's just kind of something to keep in mind if somebody shows you who they are, especially when it's something like that. Physical. Believe That's not likely going to change with time. Um, It doesn't normally happen to where somebody kind of just a switch flips after y'all sign the marriage license and then he starts beating you up. So normally, you know, they're they're being aggressive or um, gaslighting or actually being physical with them well before the the marriage happens. Mm -hmm. Um, What else? I mean, just like I said, sometimes people that are just really secretive. I mean, sometimes I talk to clients, the ones who don't know anything about their spouse. They kind of have always been that way. Like they're telling me that he never told me this. We never shared bank accounts. I never knew where he banked. To me, those are probably red flags, right? Because if I'm going to marry you, I probably need to know things about you other than, you know, what your favorite color is. So <laughs> yeah. if if somebody's being that secretive with their personal details of their life, that may not be something that will work in a marriage. Yeah. Kind of related to that. You know, I know that the law varies from state to state, obviously, but are there things that people should consider when they're figuring out if they should file for a divorce? Yes, there are. I mean, so in Texas, community property is anything purchased or acquired during the marriage, and we don't have a legal separation. So um, when it's definitely something to be considered 
um, on when you're going to file, because some people say, oh, you know what, We're, we'll just break up. Right. We'll separate. We'll go get like a child support order for our kid and we'll just handle the divorce later. And so then they don't get divorced for 10 years. Right. Because everybody's moving on about their life and they don't do it. But anything you've purchased in that period is still community property. Right. Oh. So technically, your spouse is still entitled to it. Um, so if you have a retirement, if you have assets, it's definitely something to think about when you're just going to decide to live separately with somebody, but we're not going to do the divorce yet. We'll just do it later when we get to it. Because Mm -hmm. if your 401k grows, you know, $50,000 while y'all have been separated, that's still community property that we have to deal with in the divorce. Girl, my whole face is I don't like it, right? (laughs) I don't like it. So if you know that you're not going to be with that person anymore, then you probably need to go ahead and choose to dissolve that marriage sooner than later, at least in Texas, because nobody's going to say, oh, y'all separated in 2012, but, Mm -hmm. you know, it's been eight years, but you're just now getting married in 20, I mean, getting divorced in 2020. Um, Nobody's going to say, oh, okay, so you're entitled to all of that. It's still community and we still have to address it. Mm -hmm. Wow. So before we eat, before things even go wrong, um, what do you think, what do you wish black people knew about the law before getting married? I wish black people knew that. I mean, this system just really is not built for us. Right. And um, a lot of times black people come and I will say it's better. We have a lot of more, a lot more black judges in Harris County. So these are people who can relate to you a little more. Right. And relate to issues we have culturally and things like that. But, you know, before these black judges got on the bench within the last couple of years, you know, I have clients contacting me because, you know, they're having issues with the father of their child and they're arguing over like, well, I braided her hair and I sent her over there and he's taking the braids down. I can't go into court and make those arguments because this white judge doesn't understand that. Right. That's not going to be something that they're right. gonna he don't understand the time to. and the money. They were in the frustration they went into that. (laughs) Absolutely. And that's not really something that they're going to even entertain. Right. Even with our black judges, a lot of them sometimes are going to be like, okay, that's petty. Y'all figure it out. So I wish people would understand that the more you can learn to co-parent and figure out how to be adults um, on your own without court intervention. I think that always works best. Even when we're in litigation, if we can go to mediation and reach an agreement, you have much more control over it than kind of going to a trial and, letting this judge make these decisions because sometimes they don't understand things in our community, right? Like one person may have an apartment and I know I grew up sharing a room with my siblings, right? My whole life. Like we had bunk beds. We shared a room. It was fine. But the other partner may have a house with five bedrooms and that's what they're arguing. The kids can all have their own rooms and culturally, you know, we're like, what's the big deal? Like, (laughs) We all share rooms with our siblings, but you never That's know who you're in part. front of. Yeah. <laughs> you, you ain't never know who you're in front of that may think that, okay, this person is more stable just because the kids may have their own bedrooms. Mm. So these are just things that sometimes you never know who your judge is going to be when your case is assigned randomly and you don't know how that judge is going to view issues in your household. Hmm. You know what? Even, even when you use the example of the no separation and you need to file for divorce immediately. Like I have an aunt that like the concept, like the idea of her being married to my uncle is hilarious because <laughs> they are so different. Right. And they were married technically for like 20 something years. Yeah. But they wouldn't, they would never, I don't ever remember them together, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and they probably both had their own boyfriends and girlfriends. Boyfriend, and- girlfriend, so and so living with them, like, and it was understood. But yeah, like, it's just I would have, yeah, that's. And look, so let true. me tell you when it gets super messy in Texas. I, I can't speak for every state, but in Texas, any child born during your marriage, the husband is presumed to be the father. So let's just say y'all separated in 2012, and you had three kids, 2015, 2016, 2017, by your new dude your husband is still presumed to be the father of these kids. So now we have to like sort through all this messy stuff because you've now had kids with another man and legally your husband is the presumed dad until we address that in a court order. So yeah, Mm. things can get real ugly. Because also this, this ain't cheap, you know, like Mm -hmm. it ain't, you can, it's easy as it is so easy to get married. Mm-hmm. And hard as hell to get divorced. Mm-hmm. You yeah. kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, 
both Kenria and I are divorced and we had very different divorce journeys. She yes. did the the official like hired an attorney. I was a little more took me uh, a fucking year and a half, bro. Yeah, I was a little more like uh we were I I guess you could say it was an amicable di- divorce. I mean, I don't think anyone wants their marriage to end. Right. But we were at the point where we were like, okay, so I did all the paperwork and all of that and I, I was lucky. I was lucky because mm-hmm. it just it worked out, mm-hmm. but I know it's not always that way, and mm-hmm. it takes a lot of time. You you got to show up at the court during office hours to make sure you file, and then you got to make sure you know. Like it's just it's crazy. So um, this shit ain't easy, and Mm-mm. that Mm-mm. whole that that thing there is just crazy. <laughs> yeah, and it's something a lot of people don't want to do, and I understand it. But if you think about it, your situation um, most of the time the spouses really can't um, agree and everybody just say, oh, we'll sign off on the paperwork, right? And in order for you guys to enter an agreed final decree with the court, that's where you have to be. So uh, I will say most of the time when people come to me, they're not there. We're not on the same page where we can agree and all sign the paperwork. Also, the paperwork ain't easy to sign. Like I have (laughs) multiple degrees and access to attorneys. So I was able to, so what do they mean by this? So it's it's not like friendly. It's not, you know, do it yourself friendly as it's as not, getting married. In. <laughs> it's not, and the courts are not going to help you. I mean, when you go to the court yeah. and you try to Mm-mm. turn in that paperwork or ask them, what do you do? They're going to say, we can't give you legal advice. As, yep. I mean, either you come to us with the paperwork prepared and all we have to do is present it to the judge to sign. Um, or you get somebody to look over it or help you, but they can't give you any legal advice. Yeah. Which actually leads to our next question. What do you think people tend to misunderstand about divorce before they go through it? There's a lot. Um, People tend to have a hard time understanding that just because they think something is logical, that the other person doesn't have to agree with that. I was just on a call earlier and, you know, the potential client was just really upset and couldn't understood and was, you know, complaining about her current attorney and saying that, oh, this person you know, I I should, this should be easy. This should be easy. All I want is this, this, isn't that. And so I'm like, yeah, that's what you want, but he wants the opposite. So no matter how logical you think it is that you want to get divorced and the child lives with you because you're the person who does all the work with the child, right? No matter how ridiculous the other person's argument is, they still are entitled to their day in court. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Your version of what is a easy, you know, into this marriage is usually the opposite of what the other person wants, no matter how unreasonable it is. Um, they still get their day and they still get to make their arguments. Even if everything they're saying is a hundred percent untruthful, they still get to say it. Um, and ultimately it will be up to the court to, to kind of sift through that. Also assets. I get a lot of times where people are calling me and they're like, Oh, we don't have anything because everything's in my name. It depends on your state, but in Texas, it doesn't matter whose name it's in. If y'all are married, it's community property. We have to deal with it. Um, So just little things like that. Like you really need to know where you live and what the laws are regarding how property is divided. Um, Because when you buy things, especially large purchases, if you're in Texas, your spouse could possibly be entitled to a portion of the equity of it. You know, that... um gets us to the next question. You must have our questions written out ahead of time. <laughs> I don't. Um, prenups. So mm-hmm. how common are they? Do you recommend them? Uh, I, I mean, I would I don't do a lot of prenups. I mean I don't get a whole lot of calls for them. Um again I think it depends on where you are. So um you know, depending on the state you're in, a prenup may be necessary. It may not, right? There already may be things that are kind of built into the laws where people feel a little bit more secure in the person not being able to um, have access to certain things. But it makes sense. If you have something um, ahead of time or you and your spouse have discussed something and you just want to make sure it's a clean, easy break when it, when and if you divorce, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting a prenup just to make those things clear and put them on paper. Um, I, I think that's a smart thing to do, especially if you own things prior to getting married. I, I don't see a problem. And let's just outline exactly what this is going to be, even though in Texas, 
the law says that would be the person's separate property if they purchased it ahead of time. But let's just say I have a house ahead of time and we're living in my house and now we're paying together and it's marriage toward my separate property house, right? That gets messy because once we're divorcing, if I'm the attorney, I'm going to say, okay, we've been paying down the equity in your house. Then we, the community needs a reimbursement, right? Because ultimately now you get the benefit of us paying down 10 years of your mortgage, right? So um, a prenup for things like that kind of help make things clear. Hey, this is going to be my house. You know, you're not going to have any um, right to anything or, you know, whatever, whatever we make during the marriage. This is how we'll divide it. It really just kind of sets um, a blueprint and a framework for what's going to happen in the event that you get a divorce. Mm-hmm. And then what's your best advice for folks who are fighting custody battles or anticipating them even? Um, I would just say, again, try to co-parent because it's never cute when, you know, you're coming into court and you've been withholding the child for six months because, well, you ain't have a court order that said you get you got to see him. Right. That nobody um, takes takes that as a, uh, you know, takes kindly to that. Right. Ultimately, if the courts feel like you are not co-parenting or you're making decisions that are not in your children's best interest, that can work against you. So even if you don't have a court order, even if, you know, you don't necessarily like who the new girlfriend or new boyfriend is, it's just best to try to be adults and try to co-parent because, you know, I, I can't explain how many times I've had to put my head down when somebody's reading text messages on a stand of you, you know, cussing out your baby daddy or your baby mama. Like that's never cute. Right. Mm. And also that's another thing. Things in writing can be used against you later. So That's these why text I always messages, have conversations uh, via text. Uh-huh. So Still. these text messages, these emails, like if you aren't comfortable with somebody reading it in front of a judge, I probably wouldn't put it in writing. Um, I, I mean, that's just I the can, general like, rule I, of thumb. I, as you said that, I can totally see you just like, damn, this. I mean, it gets real ridiculous. <laughs> and I'm putting my, like, just, I'm writing. You know, I'm just going to act like I'm writing because she I can't even him look at anybody's face right now. bald face, uh-huh. monkey, uh-huh. pussy lipped bastard. Everything. She done cussed out him, his mama, <laughs> fought his mama. Like, it's on video. I'm just like, uh uh-huh. <laughs> So these are things to keep in mind if, if, and especially if you know, there's going to be like most of the time, you know, if this person is going to try to fight you for custody later mm-hmm. for whatever reason, right. You know, if you were a dude who just refuses to pay child support and the whole time Look y'all were together, baby his, mamas, uh-huh, what is the other baby mamas? He refused to do it. So you helped him in that last custody case, you know, what's going to happen with you. So, mm. you know, we, you just got to be smart. So what about like negotiating for child or spousal support? So again, that would probably depend on where you live and what the laws are. Um, In Texas, sometimes we ask for temporary spousal support, like while the divorce is pending. And it really just depends if there's been a great disparity in income. So let's just say you have been a stay at home mom or dad and the other person is the person's working and they make quite a bit more money than you and they've been the person that's supporting the household, then yeah, we'd ask the court for some temporary support, right? Hey, I don't work. I haven't. We had this agreement that I wouldn't work. So I need some help getting on my feet. Um, And in Texas, you have to be married for a certain amount of time to ask for that on a permanent basis. Um, So that just kind of would vary state to state, depending on your laws. And then there are things that if one person is at fault for a breakup in the marriage, then that kind of opens other doors for us to ask for permanent spousal support. Mm, Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know here there's just a formula. It's like, how much do you make? How much do I make? How much do I pay into this child? How much do you pay into this child? They put all the numbers in Mm -hmm. and spit out something. But to your point about judges and whether or not they have empathy and who they can, you know, vibe with, all of that can get thrown out the window in court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually the judges have discretion here. Um, we have a lot of discretion because ultimately there's a formula for child support and it's a certain percentage of somebody's income. We call it guideline child support. Um, when it comes to spousal support on a temporary basis, yes, we're going to give the court the financials and kind of show them what the difference is in your bills versus your income for both parties. But ultimately the court is going to have the um, discretion to make a decision on what they should award. All right. So we always like to bring it back to books. This could be, I'm going to ask you what you're reading. 
So you can uh-huh. think mm-hmm. it could be something that's related to what you do. It could be something that's related to what we do. It can be whatever is sitting there looking at you like, hey, read me. Mm-hmm. What you reading right now? I'm currently rereading Cane River, which is my favorite book. Who's that by? I just, look, uh, I, I don't do have, I have it in here. Do you have it back there? It's by yeah. Lolita Tatami. Yep. Oh. I love that book. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Really? A listener, she's getting up to yes, get her copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I Yay! love that book. It's such a good book. It's mm-hmm. such a good book. Oh, <laughs> okay, so maybe you it. should let me borrow it since you take all my books. You don't like to return <laughs> books, so no, you can't. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> listeners, I literally. <laughs> okay, so I just redid my office, and so I had so I had all these books downstairs. I brought them up. See, they're like beautifully displayed. So I had to purge some of the books. So I called Kimria and I said. Girl, I got all these books and I can't keep them all. I'm going to have to throw some of them away. Uh, I'm going to give them out, give them away. You can come see what you want <laughs> before I give them away. It's a whole shopping Half the bag. the fucking bag was her book. <laughs> were her books. <laughs> You're like, oh, you want these back? And the, there are more of hers up here. I'm just not returning them. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but they're permanently I'm- part of your library now. Yeah. Have been for years. Yeah. This is what she does. Until I decide that I need to make space. And she can she can choose to take them or not. So yeah. terrible. But yes, Cane River. Love yes. it. So I, yeah, and I'm listening. Well, now I'm not reading it actually. I'm listening to it on audiobook because I wanted mm. to hear it. Mm. Um because I've read it a couple of times. But yeah, I love it. I love that book. Such a good book. I consider listening to audiobooks to be the same thing, honestly. I know some folks try to act stank about it, but I usually, well, not now, I'm so busy, but typically I have mm-hmm. something that I'm, a book that I'm listening to and a book that I'm reading for pleasure and then a mm-hmm. book that I'm reading for the show, mm-hmm. like always in rotation. It's the same yeah. shit. It just lets you read at different times. But I guess since I'm not in a car so much anymore, mm-hmm. I've lost my book or listening time. Yeah, yeah I'm like, feel like, oh, I'm gonna, sorry, dear. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I uh, am like t- Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> Taking up all your time. Yeah, it's like, oh my God, I'm just, I have something going on TikTok. I'm trying to record on Instagram. No, I'm horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's very true. And I feel like with audiobooks, like I have a little bit of road rage. So listening to a book in the car helps to calm me. So yeah. I mm-hmm. feel like I really listen to audiobooks more than I actual read these days. Mm. Yeah. Okay. They're lovely. <laughs> okay, so before we wrap this up, I'd like to ask a few rando questions so i want you to finish the sentence okay Okay. i always laugh at hmm people falling i'm childish (laughs) (laughs) oh no (laughs) i will ask if they're okay but i will laugh every time okay all right right. are children included in that no you know not little kids but (laughs) i was about to say those are the best ones Uh, if they're okay I am a, I am a cool ass girl, man. I just am like, yeah. I know everybody says that, but like, I just am really even tempered most of the time. Um, I'm a good time. You know, people love me. <laughs> Cause I'm a bad <laughs> bitch. And you you know. Know. <laughs> okay. Wait, what's your sign? I'm a Capricorn. Oh. <laughs> a late, a late December Capricorn. I was not expecting that at all. Really? No. What did you think? I just, Capricorns, well, Capricorns do love the fuck out of themselves. But I was, (laughs) (laughs) as you should, my partner's a Capricorn. I adore him. Um, But no, I was expecting, you know, somewhere more of a a, a Leo, an Aries, which is what I am. You know, we real definitive on how we feel about ourselves. Yeah, you know, I'm a Capricorn. I love it. I mean, you just gotta know. I think I think that has come more with age, mm, probably yeah. than my sign. Like I just know. I know I'm a catch. You know, I know I'm cool. Yes. Yes. What it is. It's fine. I love it. Live in it. Mm, yes. I'm a bad bitch. And what? <laughs> and what? And what? Okay. Speaking of which, my pettiest turnoff is mm. No, I'm not going to say that because that wouldn't be nice. Um, oh, no. I don't like braggers, right? If I'm dating and you like are trying to name drop, that doesn't impress me. It actually does the opposite. Like mm-hmm. that will turn me off real so quick. So no Leos. 
Yeah, <laughs> I've never dated a Leo, so you uh, are you're good. You yeah, I don't do yeah. the humble brag like that. Doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. Not into it. Oh my god, I just finished. Almost, ugh, I'm so tired. I ran twelve <laughs> miles this morning and fed <laughs> fed six homeless families. Yeah, yeah, you know, back when you know, back when I sold my first house for like you know seven hundred and fifty thousand when I was uh, like twenty two. You know, but look, I hate it. I, I mean, I don't mind people who can talk like speak well of themselves but i just say it with your chest like i don't like the the fake like the fake modesty or the fake humility like yeah. all right just say that shit congratulations <laughs> but certain things you can tell they're just trying to brag because yes. it doesn't even fit into the conversation right <laughs> you could have told me you sold a house i don't know why i needed to know how old you were or how much you sold it for i like yeah. those shoes well you know what I wore shoes when I walked out of that house. I sold a twenty-two for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, so I don't like that. That that didn't work for me. That's okay. funny. That's always been one of the things about DC that bugged me. Like mm-hmm. I feel like DC is full of those people. Right. Ooh, I'm mm-hmm. not a fan. I, I mean, I love living in this area but I don't like that shit and I remember when I came back here after living in New York and like the first time somebody asked me like what I did and I was like. Ugh. I'm a whole ass person. Right. That's not all that I am. <laughs> We've talked yeah. about this. See, I don't mind people asking what I do because it's a, it's a difference between just being in a conversation and it being that they ask because now they want to tell you what they do. Oh, you dig? yeah, honey. I, yeah. <laughs> but I'd be quick to be like, girl, I don't nobody care about that shit. Exactly. I will say that. I will exactly. say that. Yes, what you, you do. do for fun? Like, yeah. Tell, yeah. Like, tell me that. It, it, if my employment doesn't come up in the conversation, like I, I mean, literally, I don't talk about what I do unless somebody specifically asks, especially in social settings, because I just yes. don't know why I would ever be important. So I got this contract I need you to read. Right. Like. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it's not the most interesting thing about you, right? Not, yeah. When not. people ask me what I do, I'm like, yeah, I got a job. But let me tell you, I like to right. talk about pussies on the weekend. <laughs> right. <laughs> I work. Moving on. Exactly. Exactly. Well, this has been lovely. Yes, y'all are so much fun. So are you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for coming on. It's always having me. You know, I have, I enjoy, I've like gotten joy out of seeing like just black women that are just bad ass. Like it has become like so pleasurable. And so (laughs) having you on, just seeing just a bad bitch ass black woman that's an attorney that knows her shit mm-hmm. and in, in a state like texas like mm-hmm. i'm just you this has been a high like i really <laughs> love it this is like black women doing a damn thing is like porn to me so oh, i love yeah. it and in houston the i mean the black girl attorneys like their baddies and everybody being in court like killing it and looking mm-hmm. so good while doing it and i love it Yes. That's awesome. I love it. Yay. <laughs> well, so for folks who want to catch up with Tresha, you can go to SeelyLawGroup.com or you can follow you on IG at uh, Seely, S E A L Y underscore law underscore group, right? On IG. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. And on Facebook, you're the Seely Law Group. Yes. Hey, okay. Hey. Now y'all know how to find her. And that's it for this week's episode of The Turn One. Thanks for listening, and we'll see y'all next week. Peace out. Bye. This episode was produced by us, Kenry and Erica, and edited by Ballistic. The theme music is from Brazy. Now you can support The Turn On and get off. Subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, then drop us a five-star review, and you'll be entered to win something that's turning us on. Just post your review and email us a screenshot at theturnonpodcast at gmail.com to enter. Our Patreon page is also live. Become a supporter today and you'll gain access to lots of goodies, including the Turn On Book Club and two-for-one raffle entries. And don't forget to send us your book recommendations and your sex and related questions. And follow us on Twitter at theturnonpod and Instagram at theturnonpodcast. You can find links to books, merch, transcripts, guest info, and other fun stuff at theturnonpodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we will see you soon. Bye.